so I'll call the meeting to order. And Connie, if you'll lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, this is our special meeting, which the intent for this meeting is to interview applicants for the position of District 2 Commissioner. We have seven applicants. Uh, there are six listed here today. Uh, the seventh, Brent Berry, we have not been able to get a hold of. He had informed us previously that he was going to be out of town. Uh, I understand that he still is out of town until Saturday. So we are hoping to set up an interview with him on Tuesday. But since we have not heard back from him yet, uh, that will um, have to be coordinated. And then we'll probably put out a special meeting notice on Monday for that meeting on Tuesday. Um, likely at about 10 o'clock if that will work for him. Um, that's what works for me. I will be in Olympia, so I'll have to call in and we'll do some go-to kind of meeting so I can uh, listen in to his uh, questions. But I understand that works for you, Connie, correct? Okay. Okay, so uh, let's see. It's about 9.05. Uh, so the, each of these interviews uh, are expected to take about 45 minutes. And uh, we're just going to try to do one after another and then take a break at lunchtime uh, and then do two more in the afternoon. So, and we will have a public comment session after that point, uh, after we have interviewed the last person. And then uh, Connie and Commissioner Beauvais and I will adjourn into executive session to discuss the qualifications of the candidates. I don't anticipate, we'll, we won't be making any decision until after we interview uh, Mr. Barry on Tuesday, but the intent is for us to check reference, uh, references from Tuesday through Friday, and then hopefully if all goes well, we will announce on Friday who our, uh, who our selected appointee is. Is that about right? Yes. Okay. Great. So, uh, Mr. Burke, will you please join us? And first of all, I want to express my deep thanks for your willingness to apply and be part of this uh, wonderful organization and take this thankful job, thankless job at times, but it's uh, good and important work. And um, I'm excited that we have a lot of fine candidates that have applied, especially yourself. So. Um, I think you have a list of the questions that we intend to be asking you. Um, I'll read the odd number of questions to you. Um, con uh, Holly is going to be... Oh, did I? Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. I'm doing even. I'm doing even? Okay. So, uh, I will do even questions and uh, Connie will do odd and we're going to try to keep it to the uh, first question at five minutes. And then the next, about two or fewer, I mean, if we get done in less than 45 minutes, that's great for all of us. Uh, and so, but want to give you a full opportunity to share your positions on different issues. So Holly, if you'll be tracking the time for us. Uh, the individual questions? Uh, yeah, what do you think, Connie? An individual questions or, I mean, I don't want to have a green, yellow, red light, but we do. We want to make sure we get to these and, and we <coughs> likely will have some follow-up questions and that kind of thing, so. It would be a good idea to keep time on the questions because we need to get through all the questions because we have to ask the same question of yep. every candidate, so yep. we don't want to run out of time. So if we questions. start getting off track, if you'll kind of uh, give us a notice of that, that would mm -hmm. be very appreciated. Yeah. Okay. I would think three minutes. We have 12 questions in three minutes. So sure. Five minutes five. for that would be. Okay. Sounds great. Okay. Mm -hmm. So three minutes each. Three minutes on questions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, go ahead, Connie. So, Mr. Burke, we would like to hear from you what your message would be if you were out on the campaign trail running for this position. Okay. 
I just like to start by saying thanks that I was part of this process, regardless of who you take. I appreciate this opportunity and just looking at the candidates that are that are there. I think you have some great choices, and uh, whether it's me or not, that you have some good good choices to choose from. Uh, in terms of, of what I would say if I was running uh, for office, uh, I think there's uh, three things that I would that I would bring up. First of the, the one that I think I would bring up is this continued support of trying to find um, some type of air service to go uh, in and out of Port Angeles and to do it in such a way that makes it work long term for the future of Port Angeles and that would to me that seems when I was using the air service when it was here was to have as many flights as possible so it, it worked out for for transitioning from SeaTac to other airlines and so I am very very much supportive of of what's happened so far and continuing in that effort uh, the other area I would I would speak about would be to work at creating a diversification of the revenue streams that the port has uh, to create some that would work in collaboration with the timber revenue that that the the port has right now uh, I think there's some complementary revenue streams that could work with the timber revenue that would be good uh, to look at I think any business in a private business or even in the public sector you want to look at diversification and that creates stability within the organization when you're not relying on one specific revenue stream uh, the other area that I would I would talk about would be to uh, to emphasize customer service as a um, regardless of the revenue stream within the port uh, I believe like the business that that I'm part of now the the park district that runs the pool um, we have a similarity here as we do there is no one has to use port services and when no one has to use your services customer service is going to be the priority of that organization uh, it's not like a monopoly or a utility where you don't have a choice you have to use electricity so you have to go with whoever provides electricity no one has to use port facilities and because of that customer service is going to be a main pillar of that business and it's important that that you don't that you don't forget that people don't have to use you uh, I did that we, we kind of incorporated that in when I took over the aquatic center and as a result we've we've probably tripled the attendance and the revenue of the aquatic center as a result of that and and that wasn't anything revolutionary it was just applying common common business practices and customer service we give them what they want and we try to give it to them at a price that that makes them want to choose that versus other things like in the aquatic center you can go bowling you can go to a movie you can go to a lot of other things besides go to a pool and so we have to, we have to present the pool in a fashion that that's a choice that they would like to make and so I, I would I would love that to be a main pillar of of the uh, port of Port Angeles in in, in all of their business um, their 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 business streams and the revenue streams uh, the third one I would I would uh, like to emphasize would be um, the the public and private uh, collaboration and I think there's some great exciting opportunity with the Marines trades area that can that will bring out opportunities for both public and private collaboration and I think that that's very exciting to be part of from the ground floor moving forward and uh, I, I would just like to I would give my support wholeheartedly into moving in that direction to create um, a, a public-private collaboration within the marine trades area that can that can be used to to kind of bring it off as a starting ground for uh, developing that area that used to be the Cape Line. Okay, great, thank you. I don't know if that's five minutes or not. But. I think. 
we'll just keep track of four minutes and thirty six seconds. Very good. <laughs> uh, nicely done. So um, the first question that we have is what port lines of business do you best understand and which ones are new to you? Uh, well, I'll start with the ones that I do understand. Uh, marinas, I do understand. Uh, I grew up in San Diego. I grew up um, in a family that had sailboats. So always part of a marina, always been part of uh, the water. Uh, I am familiar with, with, I would say, I don't know how you guys term it, but, you know, commercial business parks. You know, the management of that. When, when I had a business, we rented within a, a business park that was, um, so I kind of understand the tenant side of tenant landlord and commercial areas. Uh, I, I think I understand quite a bit about the airports. Uh, what, I, what I'm new in is log yards, and I, I, don't quite, I don't quite have my head around the changing of tariffs depending on where you set logs, whether it's by the water versus over at the airport versus floating in the water. Um, so that, was, that would be something I would need to, to get greater understanding of and learning. And, and I'm not as familiar with marine terminals, you know, the big ships. Um, I, I see them, I understand what they're doing here, I understand kind of um, the role the port has with the marine terminals, but I think that's an area that I would like to, to know more about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Tell us about the opportunities and challenges that you see for two of the port's lines of business. Uh, I'll, I'll bring up two. Uh, first one I would like to, well, I would look at is marinas. And uh, in the, my background is I had a business in manufacturing. We manufactured parts for um, the racing industry. And there's a term that we use that's, uh, that's important in the manufacturing business. It's called excess production capacity. And that's when you invest assets into a, in part of your business that not necessarily has a, um, a return of your investment. And, and I see in the marina here that we may have excess capacity for the marina. It, it may be larger than what this, this area can justify in terms of um, how much people will use the marina. And I see that in the vacancy uh, reports that the, that the port gives at the meetings. And um, even though that's a challenge, it's also an opportunity to look at retooling part of that marina maybe into a different use. And uh, what you don't want to do is you don't want to drop a lot of your resources into something that has excess capacity because your return on investment in that was going to be very poor. And, but what you also want to do is you want to not make decisions in terms of that the choices you make can't be undone as well because, because circumstances change and, you know, if you brought the fi fishing industry back here in a greater capacity, you, would may, need, you may need more, more area. The, one of the ideas I was thinking of is, is creating more of a, a large boat um, dockage or wharfage in that area that then could be used in the marine fisheries, but it would it would um, be retooled away from the pleasure boat into a larger uh, for yachts and those kind of things. And and so that's one area I see as a as a as a problem, but also an opportunity to to create a a new revenue stream. Uh, the other one that, that I saw as an opportunity and a challenge is, is going to be the Marine Trade Center. And one of, the, one of the things that's very exciting about that is um, we don't have it here, but there's, there's, a, um, there's a program that the Department of Commerce has called Innovative Partnership Zones. And I think that would be a very good tool to use for the Marine Trades area. And I, I think that would be something that would be good to look at in terms of um, finding as many tools as possible to give the marine trades area the biggest um, chance of success possible. And I think the uh, Innovation Partnership Zone would be a very good um, tool that could be used for that area. 
Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, number four. Do you see current weakness? Do you see a current weakness in the way the court operates? And if so, what would you do to change it? Uh, I don't necessarily look at these as a weakness, but more of uh, things to look at to make sure that they're in balance. And one of those is uh, the port does have a lot of lines of business. Uh, you have a, I believe you have around nine uh, lines of business, and that's a lot for any agency to have. And so I, I would look at um, wanting to see which ones of those have the greatest economic development potential and possibly um, taking some of those lines of businesses and reducing the amount of resources that are that are required to keep them going uh, I know there's some that are going to be your bread and butter lines of revenue that you just you need to have because they're the ones that bring in revenue but there's some that will be more revenue neutral that maybe take more resources than you want uh, one of the examples I'll give for that would be uh, the John Wayne Marina. John Wayne Marina may not have much economic growth potential left just because of the development around it. Uh, one of the ideas that you could do would be to create um, almost like what, uh, what uh, developments do when they have like a... Um, <coughs> A, a, a management company that could that could deal with the the management of the the marina and you could do it in such a way that it was developed kind of like a homeowners association where the people that actually use the marina are kind of in charge of maintaining the marina uh, one of the benefits that gives you is then they're involved in the process of determining rates and they also have to determine how to keep the facility operating and keep it in a good in good standards so they can bring in tenants and then you would you would put the the marina into a trust and and have a the owners association manage it and that might relieve some of those lines of businesses that don't have as great of economic growth potential as others and to be able to streamline and laser focus more on the areas that have those growth potentials. Uh, I, I think, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, moving away from being so revenue dependent on the timber industry, I think, would be one area to look at. Uh, what I don't want is one to sacrifice for the other. You want something that works in collaboration, that works uh, alongside and not in competition with, with the timber because the timber has been and will always be a major part of our community because it's such a large resource that we have here. Okay, great, thank you. <clears throat> What do you consider to be the most challenging aspect when dealing with the public? I would say that uh, in my experience in, in running the, the pool district, uh, the most challenging aspect is getting good information and complete information to the public. And I found that when you do that, they generally understand the decisions that you've made. Uh, the trick is is getting the complete and good information to the public and I have found that the best tool for that is transparency uh, and and I and I'm probably on a overdue transparency because I think actually transparency is also a good strategic goal to have I found that we're, we're very transparent at, at the pool district if if it's a document that we sign, we put it up for people to look at. And I found that when you are very transparent in everything you do, whether it gives you a, whether it highlights something good or not, um, it builds trust. And I think trust is critical to build because that helps you in your achieving your strategic goals if you can build trust in the community. And I think that transparency has to do with uh, not only the citizens and the public, but it has to do with your stakeholders and also the people that do business with the port. 
if you're completely transparent in everything that you can, obviously there's some things you can't. When I was in private business, um, I couldn't keep track of how many NDAs we had to sign because we were dealing with race teams with very proprietary information. So we were always dealing with NDAs. And so there's some things obviously you can't be transparent on, but everything that you can, um, the more transparent you are, the greater there is um, of building that trust uh, to the citizens. <coughs> and it's also the easiest way to get the right information out. I'd much rather say when, when someone comes to me and, and I don't want to say, well, do a public records request. I'd much rather say it's on our website. You know, that's much better than say, well, do this request and we'll find it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I found to be the most successful in the, in the public sector. Okay, thank you. What do you see as customer service policies and goals for our stakeholders and tenants? Uh, one of the one of the areas I found excuse me, I'm gonna take a drink of water. <coughs> one of the areas that that I that I feel in, in the customer service goals is understanding the business of of the people that are using you like you're the landlord of. So they're using you, they're your tenants. Um, understanding their business, what are some of the barriers of their business that maybe we could assist in in overcoming? Um, and I think that's important because uh, one, it shows that, that their business is important to you. And also, um, I think it's an advantage if we can be as a landlord, the best, that we become the best decision that they've made, that being a tenant with the port is a good business decision for them. And I think that's the goal that we want with, with our tenants is that there's an advantage to being a, a tenant with the port because of what they can help us with. And, and I think understanding their business, what their barriers are, uh, to overcome is an important part of that. I, I think there's some logistical things that you could possibly look at to help create less adversarial um, parts. I think separating out the negotiating part from tenant management would be a good, um, and you could do that a lot of different ways. You could do that through subcontracting, you could do that with different <coughs> departments within the port, but I think if you the negotiating part and the management of the tenants, if those are two are separated, you don't have that, you don't start the relationship in an adversarial position. And I think that's, that's what's important as anytime you start a relationship off in an adversarial role, it's, it's difficult at best to try to get it to the point where you work well with each other. And I think separating out the negotiating part would help in that. Um, and I think understanding on both sides um, realistic expectations. I think bringing the cards out on the table on both sides so both, both parties have realistic understandings what, are, what, what is capable, what is able to be done, and what is not. And I think when you go into it with those realistic expectations, it helps quite a bit. Thank you. Policy and procedure topics would you be most interested in exploring if you were appointed? Uh, I'm not sure exactly in terms of policies and procedure topics, but there's a, a couple things that greatly intrigue me that the port is part of, of their um, of part of their business model, and one of them is the Industrial Development Corp. I, 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 I did some reading in the RCWs related to the Industrial Development Corp, and I think there's some possibilities of, of using that as a tool beyond just a fund raising mechanism. And, and so to me, it's very intriguing of what that corporation can be used of in terms of a benefit to the uh, tenants and possible tenants of of landlord, being a landlord to certain businesses, 
Uh, I don't understand it completely. I, I kind of know how it's used for a funding mechanism, but there seems to be greater potential there than just that. Um, I, I, when I talked in the beginning, we talked about the innovative partnership zone, and I think that's another area that I would like to look at. There's about 14 of them in the state. There's none of them in Clallam County, and I, I think that would be something to look at. We used to have them. Did we used to have one? Okay, so that'll be something to maybe to maybe look mm -hmm. at. Running about five minutes behind. Okay, thank you. What is your experience in finance and understanding of financial documents? Uh, that's a a large question. Uh, I, I have experience in two ways. Uh, being a uh, private business uh, owner. I have a great amount of experience in the traditional way you do financial reporting and financial accounting. And when I uh, decided to run the, the pool district, I got exposed to a whole different kind of financial accounting, which is public financial accounting. And, and that's done very differently than private business accounting. I found that in private business uh, accounting your your main focus is on profitability or return on investment in public finance accounting your main goal and priority is accountability and so both of those are very different and because those are different your reporting is going to look a little bit different and so um, one of the things that I think I bring um, as uh, as an as a plus would be that I, I understand both types of accounting. Uh, I do, I do the the government accounting. I've done five budgets. All five budgets have received the Distinguished Budget Award from the Government Finance Officers Association. So I, I know how to do government finance reporting. I know how to read government finance reports. Uh, but I also know that there's times and opportunities that private business um, financing has things that can can be brought into the public financing uh, reporting and accounting that do work there's some things that don't work at all because of the priority you know our most important thing in the public is accountability it's not accountability is not a priority in in a private business it's going to be a return on your investment it's going to be profitability that's not the the core most important issue here and so I think I understand both and how you can balance using both techniques because you are a business and you are a public entity and that that's a unique situation that you're in that not a lot of government entities are in. Thank you. Do you have enough time available for court meetings and other community obligations? Yes, I do. I'm I'm currently just working part time, so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't volunteer for this uh, position unless I did have time, because I, I do know that it does need some time, especially in the beginning, to to gain an understanding and a foothold of where things are at. So it, it is going to require some time to to be put towards it. Okay. Uh, Ten. How should the Port Commission interface with other public agencies and organizations? I, I think it's important that we do interface. Uh, one is that there's there's no agency within our county that has all of the resources required. Uh, because the size of community that we are, all the agencies have a limited amount of resources that are able to be brought to bear towards economic development. And so I think it's a very important uh, for us to collaborate with the others. And, and when I mean collaborate, I think it's important for us to know what are our strengths and what are our weaknesses, what, what, do, we, what do we do best, and be able to focus on what we do best and let the others do what they do best and how that can mesh together. I think a great example of that in our community is our uh, mental health. Uh, there's quite a few mental health agencies that have responsibilities within our community, 
but they have done an excellent job collaborating together, doing what they do best, and not overlapping and trying to do things that other areas could do possibly better. And I think that's a good model to look at in terms of collaboration with other agencies that have responsibilities for economic development. Thank you. Thinking back to past life experiences when you made an important decision, tell us about a decision you made that you later regretted, and what did you learn from that experience? Uh, I'll bring up two. <laughs> uh, one is, in, in the private sector, um, it, it took me a while to learn how to create a culture of innovation. Uh, and to do that, one of the, one of the things that stifles innovation the, the most is the managerial response. And depending on how you response, respond, and, and it only has to do with, with things not succeeding or things failing. I mean, obviously everybody can respond well when things succeed, but it's how you respond when things don't succeed that can very much stifle innovation. And, and, and it took me a little bit to learn how to respond to um, when things don't succeed so that I don't stifle the to creating a, a you know a, a an area of innovation because they're not always going to succeed they're not always going to be home runs there's there's going to be um, times that they don't succeed at all I think from a from a commission or a managerial standpoint is looking at those failures and trying to find what we can learn from those failures moving towards the future, towards trying to find the successes. Um, I, I'll give an example of one that I had. Uh, we wanted to, the pool district wanted to be part of the tuna drive that we do as a community to raise, to raise um, tuna for the food bank. So I decided, well, we'd have a free weekend. If you brought tuna, you could go use the pool for free. I thought that would be a great idea. And we got really good response, got lots of tuna, lots of people did that. I thought, this is a great, this is a great idea. And then I brought, we brought all the tuna to the food bank, and, and when I was there, I asked them, why do all the tuna have this black mark through the, through the scan bar code? And she goes, oh, that's tuna that came from here. And so I learned that all we did was recycle tuna that was at the food bank to start with. And so that was an idea that was a great idea, execution not so good, so we'll do it a different way next time because it didn't, it didn't accomplish what we wanted. But as a manager, you want to show that, you want to support <clears throat> that they're willing to try innovative ideas and not all of them will succeed. And even the bosses don't succeed all the time. Thank you. What do you wish to accomplish during this appointed term as a port commissioner? Um, one of the things that I would like to um, accomplish is I, I think that you have a very strong strategic plan. Uh, I think there's some metrics in it that could be worked on a little bit, uh, but I, I think the, the goals and, and focus of the strategic plan is good. I think what I found in experience, um, where strategic plans tend to um, fall short, is that you do the strategic plan, but the main element to a successful strategic plan is coming up with a, a strategic communication plan. How do we get this information to the people that need it? Um, and, and if the communication plan isn't implemented as part of the strategic plan, what you have is, is you tend to have a document that sits on a shelf that's not as vibrant, it's not as active as it could be if you have a strategic plan that goes along with how do, how do we communicate this to the people? How do our tenants know what our strategic plan is? How do they know what our priorities are? How does the public know what our priorities are? How does the people that work for the port know what our priorities are? <coughs> and, and I think what happens is, is you, there's so much effort done in the strategic plan, when you get done, it's like, whew, we did it. And then there's not the element of developing a, a communication plan 
to disseminate that strategic plan. And that would be something that I would like to, um, to be part of in, in working on is how do we disseminate this information so people know what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, the other thing I would like, would like to be part of is, and I think this is done, but maybe done a little bit more formally, is what I would call a strategic asset management plan, which is be looking at each of, your, each of the assets that the port has and seeing how those assets fit into the strategic plan, and if they do, and how do they, and then determining what type of resources are required to move those assets uh, forward to create economic growth. And I think it's important that you attach your assets to your strategic plan in some fashion that you, you know how each of these assets fit in with the, within the strategic plan and which ones don't and which ones maybe you need to put more resources towards and, and what ones you do not need to put resources towards. Uh, Connie, do you have any follow-up questions? I don't have a follow-up question, but I do have one additional question that I would like to ask all of the candidates. <clears throat> Historically, the log business has been the port's bread and butter for its operating revenue. What do you see as the future for this line of business and for timber products? Uh, I see... I know that there's a candidate that's coming that would probably be able to give you a much better answer than me, but I'll give you what my experience has been since living here, is that the timber revenue is, is because of the market, is very cyclical. It's going to go up and down. And so I, I think it's very important for the, for the port to understand that and to develop within their strategic plan um, how you survive this cyclical environment and, and there's not, you're not going to ever remove that revenue stream from the port because it's such a massive part of our resource here. Uh, to ignore that is to ignore a huge part of, of a natural resource that we have. And so it's more of a, an idea of how do you manage the cyclical process of timber revenue than whether you do it or not do it. It's, it's how you manage that. Thank you. Thank you. So please share your experience in evaluating risk in a contract. And what's your philosophy in evaluating risk of a contract in comparison to the need to grow our economy and create contracts? Uh, my, my philosophy of risk is if you, if you don't if you create a situation where there is no risk, there usually is no potential. And so you're not going to eliminate risk completely from anything. Uh, I think a great example is in, in, in one of the areas that I have experience in, which is recreation. Um, if you eliminate risk from recreation, you eliminate the fun. Um, part of the fun is the risk that's involved. And, and so that in a business aspect is generally risk and reward are what coincide with each other. And so there are times that you're going to have to risk exposure to, to possibly create the opportunity that exists. Uh, the, the trick is, is to minimize the risk as much as possible. But if you're to go forward and say, we'll just do things that don't have any risk, there there probably will also then be very few opportunities that you're going to have open to you. Great. I think that's about it. Yes. Uh, did we, you know, the one, I guess the one follow-up I did have was a commitment to running again, running in 2017. Because that wasn't actually a question on that. It wasn't a question. We yeah. asked it as an additional yeah. question if you want to it. I can answer that. Sure. Would you, <laughs> would you verbally commit to us to run again in 2017? Yeah, I would. I, as of this point uh, in time, I would definitely be interested in running again, you know, short of some type of personal massive change in my life. I would see myself running again because this is the community that we're planning on staying in. And, 
Okay. And so I wouldn't see that as a problem. Perfect. Thank you very much, Steve. Oh, you're welcome. Very much appreciate it. Thanks. Thank appreciate you. the time. I'll leave this for someone else. I'd just like to start by saying thanks that I was part of this process regardless of who you take. I appreciate this opportunity and just looking at the candidates that are that are there, I think you have some great choices. And uh, whether it's me or not, that you have some good good choices to choose from. Uh, in terms of, of what I would say if I was running uh, for office, uh, I think there's uh, three things that I would that I would bring up. First of the, the one that I think I would bring up is this continued support of trying to find um, some type of air service to go uh, in and out of Port Angeles and to do it in such a way that makes it work long term for the future of Port Angeles and that would to me that seems when I was using the air service when it was here was to have as many flights as possible so it, it worked out for for transitioning from SeaTac to other airlines and so I am very very much supportive of of what's happened so far and continuing in that effort uh, the other area I would I would speak about would be to work at creating a diversification of the revenue streams that uh, Mr. Barry on Tuesday but the intent is for us to check reference uh, references from Tuesday through Friday and then hopefully if all goes well we will announce on Friday who our uh, who our selected appointee is is that about right yes okay great so uh, Mr. Burke will you please join us and First of all, I want to express my deep thanks for your willingness to apply and be part of this uh, wonderful organization and take this thankful job, thankless job at times, but it's uh, good and important work and um, I'm excited that we have a lot of fine candidates that have applied, especially yourself. So um, I think you have a list of the questions that we intend to be asking you. Um, I'll read the odd number of questions to you. Um, con uh, Holly is going to be. Oh, did I? Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. I'm doing even. I'm doing even. Okay. So uh, I will do even questions, and uh, Carney will do odd, and we're going to try to keep it to uh, the first question at five minutes. And then the next, about two or fewer, and if we get done in less than 45 minutes, that's great for all of us. Uh, and so, but want to give you a full opportunity to share your positions on different issues. So Holly, if you'll be tracking the time for us. Uh, are there individual questions? Uh, yeah, what do you think, Connie? An individual questions? Or, I mean, I don't want to have a green, yellow, red light, but we do. We want to make sure we get to these and, and we <coughs> likely will have some follow-up questions and that kind of thing, so. It would be a good idea to keep time on the questions because we need to get through all the questions because we have to ask the same question of yep. every candidate, so yep. we don't want to run out of time. So if we questions. start getting off track, if you'll kind of uh, give us a notice of that, that would be very appreciated. Yeah, okay. I would think three minutes. We have 12 questions in three minutes, and sure. five minutes five. for that would be... Okay, sounds great. Okay. Mm -hmm. So three minutes each. Three minutes on questions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, go ahead, Connie. So, Mr. Burke, we would like to hear from you what your message would be if you were out on the campaign trail running for this position. Okay. I, uh, that will um, have to be coordinated and then we'll probably put out a special meeting notice on Monday correct. for that meeting on Tuesday. Um, likely at about 10 o'clock if that will work for him. Um, that's what works for me. I will be in Olympia so I'll have to call in and we'll do some go-to kind of meeting so I can uh, listen in to his uh, questions. But I understand that works for you, Connie, correct? Okay. Okay, so uh, let's see, it's about 9.05, uh, so the, each of these interviews uh, are expected to take about 45 minutes, and uh, we're just going to try to do one after another and then take a break at lunchtime uh, and then do two more in the afternoon. 
So, and we will have a public comment session after that point, uh, after we have interviewed the last person, and then uh, Connie and Commissioner Bove and I will adjourn into executive session to discuss the qualifications of the candidates. I don't anticipate, we'll, we won't be making any decision until after we interview Meeting to order, and Connie, you'll lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, this is our special meeting, which the intent for this meeting is to interview applicants for the position of District 2 Commissioner. We have seven applicants. Uh, there are six listed here today. Uh, the seventh, Brent Berry, we have not been able to get a hold of. He had informed us previously that he was going to be out of town. Uh, I understand that he still is out of town until Saturday. So we are hoping to set up an interview with him on Tuesday. But since we have not heard back from him yet, 